Right, here we go. Welcome everybody to this meeting of the Audit and Standards Committee, which is being held in the council chamber at the town hall. It's a bit nippy here, so if you see us all reaching for our coats and scarves at any point, it's because we're determined to stay here and do the business and not go home to the warmth. A few housekeeping notes. Um, please note that social distancing restrictions and other public health safety measures still apply, so please keep your distance from others. Please remain seated as much as possible during the meeting, and if you need to leave your seat, please make sure that you wear a mask. A hand sanitizer is also available for you to use, and it's over there by the door. Um, this meeting is a public meeting and is being live streamed for the public to view. So can I ask that when you wish to speak, you raise your hand, and when I indicate you can speak, please ensure that your microphone is switched on and that when you finish speaking, please switch off your microphone. Uh, toilets are outside on the corridor, ladies to the left, men's to the right. Um, we're not aware of any planned fire alarms, so if it does go, please leave the chamber and make your way back out of the building towards the nearest fire exit, which can be found off the stairwell to the right of the chamber. So we'll now move into a quick introduction. It sounds a bit like one of those games, doesn't it? A quick fire introduction, Rick, um, of everybody in the room. So I'm Councillor Sean Admeyer Richards, and I am the chair for today's meeting. Uh, Simon. Uh, Councillor Simon Clarence Jones, Deputy Chair of um, this committee. Councillor Josie Pashek. David Barker, Councillor for Richmond Ward. Uh, Councillor Ben Curran, uh, Councillor for Walkley. Councillor Angela Kenzie. Right, so those are the councillors who are actually the members of the committee who will be making any decisions today. And then we're, the, oh, sorry, and our independent member who actually gives us all our independent advice and keeps us in place. Alison Howard, um, independent member. And we're also supported by a great phalanx of officers here. So if I start with Eugene. Uh, Eugene Walker, Executive Director of Resources. Thanks. Gillian Duckworth, Director of Legal and Governance. Claire Corney, Head of HR. Leon Kaplan, Information Management Officer. Sarah Green, Senior Information Management Officer. Linda Hunter, Senior Finance Manager, Internal Audit, Risk Management and External Funding. Claire Sharrett, Senior Finance Manager, Strategic Finance. David Phillips, Head of Strategic Finance. I'm, I'm just thinking, should you two who've sort of stuck yourself in the back there be sitting at the... Is that what we usually do? Sitting in the two chairs here? Okay, well, let's not... Right. And then, sorry, we've also got Jay Bell here who is taking our minutes. And we also have... Sorry, <laughs> Rachel, who... Is, who's webcasting us making sure we all get seen. Right, so having done all that, uh, item number two on our agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any? Yeah, I received apologies from council and I'm in room. Thank you. Otherwise, we're a full compliment. So, uh, item three, exclusion of the press and public. I don't believe we have any items which require the exclusion, so that's good. Um, item four, do we have any declarations of interest? We have none. If anything comes up during the meeting, 
you know, please do say something if you suddenly realise on page 227 it's your auntie or something. Okay, so we'll move on to item five, which is minutes of the previous meeting. What I will do is go through them for accuracy and then for any matters arising. So, for accuracy, page nine, page 10, page 11, page 12, page 13, page 14, page 15, page 16, and page 17. So can we agree those as a true record, please, Simon? Thank you. And now matters are rising, page nine. Josie. I'm a little bit in advance of Miss Dolph, it's page 11. Okay. Right, we'll wait. Page 10. Page 11, is there anybody? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was at a meeting this morning uh, discussing the uh, complaints procedure and how it's been rolled out in departments. And one of the managers was, it, because it's predominantly about a culture change rather than process and procedure change, although there are slight process and procedure changes. And um, th they were concerned about the level of take up of the online training. It only takes about 20 minutes and they, one of the things that was discussed is whether or not it could be made mandatory given the, the importance of it. Can to respond? Or Eugene? Or somebody? Um, yeah, sure. The, so, so we are, as you know, we, we have got a programme rolling out training to, um, to members of staff who are involved. Um, what we can do is, is just get, make sure that that message is out clear to the directors. We can raise it with the directors to, to make sure it's, um, it's pushed through. Um, as for mandatory training, we, as you know, we've got, um, there is a list of mandatory training and on the chart, actually, I've got, I've got the head of HR sat at the side of me, so uh, she might have something that she wants to add to this as well. Um, I'm going to hand over, if that's all right, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. Um, we do have issues with compliance around mandatory training. There are already 14 modules for managers and 11 for staff. So that's a considerable investment. We're looking at introducing further modules around carbon literacy. Um, so we've targeted the intervention here on complaints on those people that will be involved in the management of complaints. So as Gillian said, we can definitely look to drive forward um, compliance from that group. Um, but we need to seriously think about whether we want to um, extend that to everybody, bearing in mind that the majority of, of those people may not be getting involved. Just for clarification, it's, it is about the team leaders and the people that are supposed to be progressing it. And, and, the, and the thing about the new policies and procedures is that for the first time there are time limits on it. And, and it is important that people do comply with those time limits. So as long as everybody that should be progressing something knows they should be progressing it and knows that the time limits are being monitored, because obviously you can't then chase back through if somebody's not had the training, you can't then criticise them for not meeting the time limits on, on the complaints procedure. And this is something that's been brought in, not just by Sheffield City Council, but in conjunction with the Ombudsman as well. So just to note that, and I have raised it, the, and it was quite senior management that were having the discussion this morning. So as long as we're all clear that everybody that should be complying with the time scales is aware of the time scales and, and to discuss it with the manager for any reason we're not able to. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Joseph, for raising it. Shall we just log that and we'll report back? Thank you. It is important. Thank you. Okay, and can we actually ask for a report back at some stage that, that, that people are actually taking it up so that we can be clear that the new culture is being embedded? Thank you. Okay, page ten. Oh, this one. This side. <laughs> Sorry, I had something for page ten, but you didn't see me. Right. 
sorry, Councillor Argencio, page 10. Um, yes, point five eight on page 10. Um, we agreed last time that we would like to set up a private meeting of members with the auditors, and I understand that it's not possible for this year, but can we embed it so the next year we don't leave it last minute? Uh, because we didn't, um, you know, we haven't had anything back here. Uh, and also on page 11, um, regarding that as an ombudsman. Uh, Sorry, Paul, which, which one on page 11, Andrew? Uh, 6 2, which is also on page 12, 6 10. It's the time scale for the ombudsman re um, annual report for housing, whether that is coming to us this month or not. I'll, I'll just say that on the first point you raised, our people from Ernst & Young were here, and due to, I'll call it a cock-up, between myself and Jay, you didn't get the notice of it. So I take complete responsibility for you not having been able to have that meeting, and we will make sure that it does happen in future. My apologies for that, Angela. Um, and then on 6.2, do we know when we're going to get the Housing Ombudsman's report? I know they said January. Um, anybody got an idea? Sorry, no. We'll have to check and get back to you. Okay, so hopefully we'll have it on ooh, our agenda for, next, for the next meeting. Josie. Thank you, Chair. Just to say that the meeting that was had this morning was with Housing Officers and they were, they've got the report and they are putting things in place and that's what we were discussing. So it, is, it has been done and it has been progressed. And so they are already taking action on, on the basis of the Ombudsman report. So it is out there and being done and action. Well, it just might not have been brought to this committee. Right, perhaps. I'll swap places with Josie, I'll ask. Okay, <laughs> that, that sounds great. Um, can, can I ask that we have it to the next meeting because that was something that we did ask for previously and maybe it's so exciting housing don't want to share it yet. Page 12, Simon, I see that you had asked, oh, it's the same sort of question, isn't it? 6.10, you'd asked about this report as well. So I think if we're all asking for it, it's got to be first item at the next meeting. Um, page 13, um, I wanted to ask about the new ways of working with the contact centre because it's something I think that Councillor Argenti and I both raised about the fact that it was down again last week and people weren't able to report housing repairs. Or, or in fact get through to the council. Can anybody tell us about that? Right, okay. I think, I think it's best, there's a lot of ongoing work in this area. I think it's best if, if we just get another update because there, there, are, there are weekly statistics and a, and, a, and a planning place around that. So if we want to do, get something written back to the committee, I think that would be best because there's, there's a lot of complex issues. And as we discussed at the last meeting, it, it's not just about the contact centre, it's about the other services that are doing that. So for example, there's been a new system implemented in the repair and maintenance team, which, you know, which is part, part well, that's part of, it's all interrelated. So, yes, yeah, so, yes, you know, so let us, let us um, ask Mark to get something written back, yeah, around the committee, yeah. Okay, so if you can minute that, Jay, that we'd like a report from Mark, please, on that. Page 14, um, I just wanted to ask on 7.12 that seven experienced customer service staff had gone off to do track and trace and isolate. Um, have they come back yet or are they still away? Tracing. Um, they are at the moment, but we're actually just in a meeting and that's being reviewed given wider circumstances and decisions in government. So it, it, sh it should be, yes. Okay, good. Page 15. Um, again, sorry, this is sounding a bit like me talking all the time. What a difference. 
Um, it was just on, on 8.5. Um, with suggested training, I actually attended um, a piece of training online that the um, local government information unit, LGIU, uh, held, which was for elected members around conflict resolution and staying safe in unsafe places. It was incredibly useful and uh, I would recommend it for anybody and maybe we could ask them to do um, a special one for us at, at Sheffield. Um, I think conflict resolution is one of the things that councillors find most difficult, I think, at meetings that we go to sometimes with the public where we meet people who are pretty irate about things. Um, and I now have more things in my armoury and I'd like to share those with other members. Page 16. And page 17. Right, that completes the minutes and matters arising. Thank you, everybody. So our next item is item seven, which is the statement of accounts and our audit results report. Would that be you, Dave, to kick it off, or you, Jean? <coughs> well, it'll, it'll be me, I think, and the auditors obviously will come in yeah, to talk about their report. Uh, Great. Their report. Uh, I'll, I'll give a sort of a short introduction at, at the start. We're here today to review uh, what, what is the sort of post audit statement of accounts now. Uh, once approval is given and the auditors finish their, their final uh, bits of, of test, uh, not testing, but bits of reviewing and closing the file and dotting I's and crossing T's, uh, we're asking for approval from the committee to be given that the uh, chair and section 151 officer then signed the accounts, the statement of accounts and letter of representation. The letter covers various representations we make to the auditors which they need uh, assurances on um, before they can issue their opinion. Um, that, for, you know, just recapping what's happened so far, it's the accounts for financial year closing on 31st of March 21. You approved a draft uh, unaudited set of accounts on 2nd of J July which were published and sent to the auditors on, on 5th of July. They, they've been, uh, and, and to the audit committee on 20th, 29th of July. The, the audit's been going on since then. We've checked, kept the committee uh, aware of, of, of what, what's happening, so you're aware of progress so far. Um, there are probably three sort of largest changes to, to, to the accounts. One is on COVID grants where <coughs> the, with grants, you can either be a principal or an agent, and an agent largely means that the, the money is not yours and you're just holding it for somebody else, akin to a solicitor holding a set of money for a client. And a principal means they run right through your books. These COVID grants are new. We didn't know quite how they should be treated, and we treated them as agents, and the decision has been taken nationally now that they're, they're treated as principal. So that runs. So it doesn't have any impact on our financial position, but means more en entries to run through. Um, we've been, the largest figure in our accounts is probably the um, housing, council housing valuation. That depends on a housing price index that carries on moving right until now, right until December 21. So we've carried on updating that figure. And um, again, the largest but of no particular impact, property services provide us uh, figures on the valuations. And they picked up very early on in July an error in their spreadsheet, which made a £55 million pound adjustment. Again, balance sheet figure doesn't affect, doesn't affect revenue. The auditors will take you through various other things. They've got a list of uh, errors we've adjusted for, errors that, are, that we don't need to adjust for because they're fairly small, and control issues in their accounts, all of which are a, a, useful, a useful read. Um, so that's enough from, from me. I think it's a flavour of things, and I'll, unless there's any questions at this stage. I'll invite the auditors to take you to their, their work in more detail. Thank you very much, Dave. So can I pass it over to our external auditors, oh, in the corner, to get, take us through your report, I guess, yeah? Thanks very much, Chair. So um, our report's in your supplementary pack, um, and what I'll do is just give you the headlines from that and then pass to Hayley to take you through some of the key findings and the adjustments that Dave was just referring to. So on page five of the supplementary pack, you'll see that we set out the status of the audit. And as Dave has already said, you know, we're substantially complete on the work that we need to do. 
um, there are a number of areas where we just need to finalise our work and we anticipate doing that over the course of uh, the rest of this week and into next week, working with the finance team. And then we'll need to do our stand back and our close out procedures that um, we're required to do to get everything onto the file and documented appropriately, as Dave has um, already ex um, explained. So we anticipate um, on, on that basis that we will be able to provide an unqualified opinion on your financial statements within the next couple of weeks, um, subject to satisfactory closing out of those procedures. I'll move past page six, um, where we talk about you know, the, the key findings and audit differences. And as I say, I'll hand over to Hayley on those in a moment. Um, on page seven, we just talk um, about our responsibilities under the code for the value for money arrangements. And if you remember back in um, our audit plan, um, that code, those uh, code responsibilities have changed somewhat this year. So whilst we have done our work in that area and have no exceptions to report in our opinion on the financial statements, we, do, uh, we will be bringing you a commentary at a future meeting and we anticipate that will be March meeting, which will set out our key findings around the, the three domains um, of uh, governance and financial sustainability and improving the three E's and, and actually um, bring that detailed commentary to you at that point, which will set out you know, what arrangements you have got in place. Um, so apart from that, uh, it's gone very well. I think we've had great support from the, the finance function as always, um, and I'll pass over to Hayley just to take you through some of the key findings and adjustments. Hayley? Thank you. Um, so, if we start on the still in the same supplementary pack, then um, page ten of our report is um, focused on our risk of fraud in revenue recognition, um, and we had attributed that to accounting for COVID grants and then also understatement of other income. Um, as Dave highlighted um, earlier, um, the only matter that we wish to draw to your attention on that was just the treatment of the one COVID grant um, in terms of agency versus principal. Um, page. 13 of our report in relation to uh, property plant and equipment valuations. Again, Dave has uh, very kindly done my job for me and talked about both adjustments in that case. Um, so I will move on from that one. Um, page 14 um, in relation to the work that we've performed over our investment property valuations. Um, what we've identified this year is um, that for part of your investment property, um, there's a proportion of that that the council has the right to use themselves. So that should actually be accounted for as an asset as part of property, plant and equipment. Now that's not a material, um, it's not a material amount and we've estimated it's somewhere between 1.8 and 3 million in terms of its value. Um, and we've taken the midpoint of that, which is 2.4 million and included that as an uncorrected misstatement later in our report. Um, it's, it is judgmental, um, and to Dave's point, it's minimal impact in terms of uh, the INE and won't impact on the general fund position. Um, in terms of page 15 of our report, um, we've concluded out our work on the pension liability valuation. Um, there was a, a misstatement identified in the valuation of the assets within the South Yorkshire Pension Authority financial statements. Now, because you take a share of that, um, the impact on your financial statements was 2.6 million to the net position reported in the balance sheet. Um, that also has been included as an uncorrected misstatement later in the report. Um, one thing I did just want to highlight on page 16 of our report was just in relation to PFI and just to say that um, you, you may recall from previous years we've had some historic errors that were identified in some of the models and I'm pleased to report that those have actually all been closed out this year. Um, so if I then move on to page 26 of the report, which sets out the identified audit differences, the majority of these um, we've talked about or, or Dave's mentioned, I suppose I did just want to draw to your attention that the, the current list of uncorrected misstatements that would be reported in the letter of representation you would be required to sign off on is set out there on page 26. Um, I think we've discussed all of them, barring the top one, which is just in relation to um, cut off around the end of the financial year. Um, 
what I did just want to highlight in relation to that one is that we do have a line in there called turnaround effect. And effectively what that does is that takes errors that were uncorrected in the previous year and takes into account the impact on the current year's financial statements. So you actually have a um, reverse impact from cutoff errors that we found in the previous year to, that nets down that position. I think that was all I was going to comment on at this stage. I'm clearly happy to take any questions that you may have. Does anybody have any questions? I saw Josie annotating her statement of accounts earlier. I don't know if that meant that she was going to ask anything. If not, Simon, were you keen to ask things? I'll say that again slowly, Simon. Simon's going to ask some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can go back to um, page 16 on, on the, um, the auditor's report. Um, you, you very briefly mentioned it. I just wanted to understand quite what, what this error was, um, whether it was, was an error that was uncorrected this year or if it couldn't be corrected this year or quite how it didn't get corrected in, if you see what I mean. So, so the, the, the 2.5 million in relation to PFI um, would have been on last year's uncorrected misstatement schedule and the decision last year was taken not to adjust at the point in time at which it was identified. Um, it's, I suppose it's, it's just a couple of calculation errors in the um, PFI model. They're very complex. It's not uncommon to identify them. But it's all been resolved for this year. Yeah, no, thank you. I was just trying to ascertain if something hadn't been done that needed to be done, but it, it had been because it couldn't be done. Okay, I, I think I understand. Thank you. Um, if I move on to the, um, the actual um, accounts themselves, um, I've just got a few questions. Um, well, page 65, uh, 65 of, of the audit, it's the only number I've got, so I'm using the old one. Um, we've got a long-term debt to Doncaster Council for, um, quite a lot of money, uh, for a million pounds. I'm just wondering what that was, is, and why it's long-term. Page 65 of the accounts, 89 of the document, yeah. It's, um, it's the Growing Places Fund, um, Dave, which if I start talking and you tell me about it, um, we were effectively the accountable body for, um, when, when Local Enterprise Partnerships, LEP, first started, uh, the mayoral combined authority didn't exist, and Sheffield City Council took on accountable body status for the whole of South Yorkshire. Um, to process those grants. It was one of the early precursors of grants that were subsequently transferred to the Mayoral Combined Authority. Um, as to why we have still got a debt, I don't know, but that's the background to it. Do we have to follow that up, Dave? Um, we can look into why it's still there. Mark, and we can look into why it's still uh, there and, and has, been, has been there this year and last, um, Simon, but it's, it's, a, it, it's a debt in our, in our balance sheet. Thank you. Um, I'll try and get these pages right. Um, yeah, so page 120, which is 96 of um, big letters. Yeah, one, 120 in big letters. Um, and it's, well, it's around the... the, the um, General fund reserves. Um, over the past 12 months and before that, um, there's been a lot of things where, where I've, I've heard the words paid from reserves, paid from reserves. And you might see quite a lot of movement here um, in, in those reserves. Um, and what I'd like to understand is, 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 is where this position is in terms of where we expect it to be, um, where, well, where we expect it to be now, if you like. Um, because as I say, it, it, it seems to me that, as I say, a lot of, um, a, a lot of over that period, we were going to go reserves, 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 and and did that, did, did much of that crystallise, and what effect does that have on these reserves on this page? Thank you. Shall, shall I start, Eugene, and then if you if you want to interject, 
In terms of specifics, the uh, well, certainly one of the, the, the biggest movement you can spot here is on business rate uh, uh, appeals and that side of things. And there's been COVID grants, and there's been a, a, a big movement in our reserves due to COVID grants in, in the year. We, we got uh, a load of COVID grants from government just before year end in the, the last year, had to carry those on a balance sheet, and they were then all released during the year. So that affected the, the, the total balance quite a lot. Uh, our, you know, we've got to be careful. There's been a lot of talk about reserves, which are actually things this year, and there will be, um, because we're, we're reporting as at month six, a, a £35 million um, deficit this year. Uh, if that stays the same at year end, we will have to use reserves to meet that. But that won't affect these figures, because these are figures going back a year's time. And for members, uh, information when we're in the budget, budget process forward, if we're needing to use reserves to... Uh, risk base anything that again that will have an impact on our reserve position but that is a moving forward position the accounts are always you know by now quite a long way back so they're back as that 31st March 21 when um, we were still in the position of, of being able to safeguard our reserves so actually we do have uh, some need help us now um, yes yeah, so, so thank you sorry it was, it was really about that we were planning to use reserves over that 12 months, and we, we didn't, is that right? We, we didn't as much as we thought we were? Yes, yeah, sorry, to be, to, to be clearer, when COVID came in, we were really concerned that we would be not sufficiently funded for all the costs and would have to draw on reserves in 2021 to, to pay for things. In fact, the government, um, I think it's been worked out nationally uh, overall, did, did a, a pretty fair job at... Um, Funding local authorities for the short term. I'll emphasise the short term cost of cost of COVID. So we didn't have a big hit on reserves in 2021. So reserves didn't go down. That, that's not the same as this year or probably next year, but certainly was the case for last year. So I, I think I mean, from hearing Joe, these figures are basically quite out of date now, and a lot's happened since. There are a lot of temporary reasons why this went up, and I think as part of the briefing for the budget, um, for Simon. Um, and you know, we'll, 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 we've got the um, co-op uh, paper next February, in February and then for council. Um, what we're doing with reserves will form a prominent part of that. Um, and, and the auditors in here comment on, on our future financial sustainability. And I think that's something that we really need the kind of more up-to-date figures in order to be able to, be able to have a fully informed view of where we are on reserves now and where they are going forward. Thanks, yeah, it, it is always a bit after the Lord Mayor's show, isn't it? Um, but, um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, as I just still try, try and get my head around exactly what, what happened over that year and then, and then we're going forward. And um, so if I can then move to page, well, big 130, um, 106. Um, and this is on, um, well, another, another big movement in terms of um, creditors on uh, with adjustment for items from next year, obviously. Perhaps um, give us some background on that. A question, I wasn't One, sure. 130, it's, it's the movement um, increase, decrease in creditors from 19,080 and 19 million to 100 million. Page 130. I was going to say, th th these are the... Um, you're right, there's a, there's a, a movement in creditors there. The, these are actually the figures from the cash flow statement, so we have to adjust. Our, 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 our cash position is affected by whether we pay more or less out to, to, to creditors in the year and get more or less in from debtors in the year. So we're reconciling here for the movement in cash caused by the, 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 the change in creditors. You have to refer back to the creditors' note. Um, I'm going... So I'd have to go forward to the balance sheet and then check the, the exact page ref to, to see what's moved within creditors itself. Uh -huh. So the balance sheet's page 57 and creditors within that is note 19. So the, sorry, 91, thank you, Angela. So then we go forward to to 91 and so the big movement there is the movement in uh, central central government bodies so I, I would be 
90 odd percent certain that's going to be COVID related again, is it Claire? And business rates. And business rates related, yes. So there's a lot of COVID related stuff that's, that's carried on our balance sheet as of 31st of March 21 in there that has uh, in sort of inflated our creditors' position that will have drawn down during 21 22. Okay, thank you. So I thought it might be business rates or something like that, but that's obviously somewhere else. Um, so if I can then go to hopefully final one, um, where are we? Uh, one of my favourite subjects, Sheffield City Trust. Um, I'm going to guess one page one one two. I'm big, a little rather sorry. Little one one two, and then oops, straight across. Is it, is it worth just explaining, Dave? Whether we what happened on business? Basically, you, there were so many on business rates. There were so many business rates cancelled or reliefs given. We basically ended up collecting next to no business rates that year, and the government gave us massive compensation in terms of money to cover for the business rates we would have otherwise collected. So that's kind of I think that's what's underlying that that that, that big increase. And Claire's nodding. So yeah, if that helps clarify a bit further. Yeah, thank you. So I, I suspected it was something like that, but so it looked like a big movement. Just wanted to check. Um, so page one one two. Large, sorry, large one three six, little one one two. Um, on the uh, the Sheffield City Trust, it's got a note against it saying uh, note number nine, eighteen point four million plus one point five eight million. Um, the twenty, well, well it's the payments in in uh, in year twenty seven point something million. Um, where's the difference? Is that what we were already paying them, as it were? The difference will be that we have to fund um, bond repayments of Sheffield City Trust uh, over a period of 11 years to, that funded the facilities that they built. In addition to that, uh, we will, following COVID, they will have needed revenue support as well. So we've also had to pay them some of that for revenue support. So we've explained the, the capital transaction there and the remaining part is the funding their deficit, which... If members will remember other discussions around Sheffield City Trust and us trying to get them to zero subsidy, uh, not quite getting there, but then COVID making the position understandably much worse since they've obviously had facilities closed, but fixed costs still to cover. So that, that was why the cost of Sheffield City Trust, Trust is, is so high. Thank you very much. In that case, Josie. Thank you, Chair. I think a lot of my just being covered by Simon and by the audit results report, we're just going to small page 29, large number 15, large number print 53 on the housing revenue account. And again, the gross expenditure is quite different there. I just wondered if, if is that due to lack of repairs being done? Or do we know? got less than half it gross expenditure is less than half of the year before yeah th th thank you thank you Josie again it's probably helpful to to look through to the detail and the HRA is right near the near the back um, yeah, COVID again. sorry oh right it's yeah it's you just find the exact pages so if we if we if you turn through to well, do you want to take that one, Claire? You go. Hi. Um, it's, if, if we just go to the HRA page, the actual income and expenditure for the HRA, if anybody's found that page yet, um, it breaks it down a bit better. Um, and you'll see Big 152. Sorry. It's, it's page. 152. 152. And the big number. I think. So there's a, there's a better breakdown there. Um, and if you can compare the expenditure headings line by line, um, you know, the day-to-day -day management of the properties, um, that they are fairly similar. Um, and the big difference between the two years is the depreciation impairment and revaluation losses. Um, so that will be the, the impact of revaluations on the council house properties. So, you know, not a, not a cash, it's not a cash um, figure, it's just an accounting figure for revaluations and depreciation. Would that be actually in the value of the property or the fact that we've had sales or would that be shown somewhere differently? It'll just be movements in the housing price index. Okay. 
it seems counter counterintuitive that we're sort of having a hot housing market and the, and the value goes down. It seems strange. But okay, I'll, we'll look to that coming back up next year when everybody's buying the houses then. On the same page, which is small, 29 and 53, again, the remeasurements of the pension net defined benefit liability. Um, have we paid back a lot of liability there or is, is that a re-evaluation, do we know? I mean, I can see if Claire can look up the detail, but the pensions numbers are all numbers that have come through uh, from the actuary, and uh, there are a whole series of uh, movements the actuary does every year in terms of, of working through the, the liability, which is the amount that we owe out on our, our pensions, and that will be affected by fluctuations in the stock market, etc. So it's a movement, it's a thing that moves around. What is worth bearing in mind in terms of pensions, though, although Clearly, the value of the fund is very important, and the positive news is that the fund is, at the moment, more than covers uh, the value of the liabilities. Uh, last time I looked, it was 113% funded, which is very good, given that it's been down at 80 85% funded for years and years and years. It's actually moved the other way. So that's good in terms of long-term cost of the council, and in terms of short-term impact, they actually set the amount we have to pay for pensions over a three-year period and the next period come, will come up in, in a year or so's time. And, and that cash amount that we physically pay out to the pension fund is the amount that gets charged against council tax. There are then lots and lots and lots of huge, largely impenetrable figures that they actually tells us for what's happening on the underlying liability. But largely, well, that doesn't at all affect the council's position or council tax, so it's, it's not something to be worried about. You know, what, what the government tries to do in all these things, and it's the same on the, some of these movements on council, on, on council dwellings and depreciation and revaluation things, those all come into our accounts because that is the correct private sector way of accruals accounting for these things, but they all sort of reverse out and then we get um, things akin to the, the, the amount we need to pay for council tax that actually goes through. So you can see some very scarily big numbers in, in the accounts. I remember that valuation on council dwellings moving by £500 million one time a few years ago. And suddenly it looked like we were spending £2 billion in the year rather than £1.4 billion. But it had no real impact. It was just the government deciding to uh, devalue um, council housing as a book figure. So a lot of these things look quite big and scary. Mm. But in, in reality, they're in and out figures and they don't affect council tax and they don't affect our our underlying financial sus sustainability. So the pension figures are very much like that. We're paying a, a set amount through to, to the fund every year, that set, and the fund and that would go up if the fund was was didn't have enough money to cover its liabilities. At the moment it does. So you know, talking about uh, re using reserves and things later on, we have a reserve expecting as we have done for the last 20 years, our pension costs go up in the future. That might well be a, a reserve that we can dip into now to cover our financial position this year because it looks like the fund is going to stay overfunded now. So that that means we've set a reserve up prudently, expecting a cost to go up. It looks like it won't, so we can use it. So it's an interesting strand through to, to previous questions here. I've talked yeah. for far too long. And has a risk evaluation being done on that given obviously a lot of the valuation of the pension fund is on uh, share prices and a lot of share prices have been hit because of covid so as a risk evaluation mean done will the share prices be back to look as though they, they're good for funding the fund by the time the evaluation actuarial evaluation is done or, or is there a risk that the shares will be much lower in value that, that's a great question. There, there is always a risk that the market will move the other way. The, the, so the position has changed really quite quickly from underfunded to overfunded. And what that tells all of us is it could equally move quite quickly from overfunded to underfunded again. So we're certainly not going to be looking to, to, to use you know, all, all the stuff we've got to set aside for, for pensions. But at the moment, it's been positively funded for a couple of years now. Uh, despite COVID, it's still... Um, showing us positively funded. The, the actuary is going to start using the figures um, round about March this year to do valuations during the year to set our um, payments for the, the following three years. So unless things go badly quite quickly now, we should be okay for the following three years. 12 months ago, 
I would have said the fund's looking positive, but it's quite a long way to the next valuation, so I wouldn't recommend touching anything in that reserve. I think as we get nearer and nearer to the date when the next valuation comes through, it is more and more reasonable on a risk basis to use some of it. But every time you use a reserve, one, you can't replace it, and two, you're effectively taking a bit more risk because you've got less yeah. contingency in your balance sheet. So you're absolutely right to, to highlight those factors. Thank you. Um, again, small, small page 30, large page. A little bit of information if you want, because actually, um, going about stock markets, the, the pension fund does invest abroad as well. It's not just about our stock market. And, you know, one of the things that has, has continually affected and positively, interestingly, so that the devaluation of the pound makes all the foreign investments more more valuable, and that's a big, been a significant contributor to the pension fund getting better. It's a bizarre Good. consequence of Brexit. Good news, bad news. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, again, going on to page thirty and small thirty, big fifty-four. And it's about reserves, because obviously reserves are going to be coming increasingly under pressure. Um, and it's the risk versus the reserves. So you sort of got those headlines reserves. Where, where does the sort of climate warming, warming risk come into the reserves for increased flooding and various things like that? Or if we have sort of rough land fires or something in because if we have a, dr a drought in the summer, is that built in somewhere in these reserves? I, I don't think we have a specific climate change reserve. What we do have, um, we have a series of reserves set aside for things, and then we have our remaining, what we call our unearmarked general fund balance, which has stayed at around about 3% of revenue, 13.3 million pounds or so, uh, for as long as I can remember. That was the reserve that we used back in 2007 when we had flooding and had a load of flooding costs. So in the first instance, we would use that. It is really worth emphasising, and we have to do then, if we spend that, we have to build that back up to around about 3% of revenue because that is the minimum assessed level we can use. So it's not a, a long-term get-out-of-jail-free card. But if we had another round of flood, flooding in the first instance, we use that. I do know we have, for example, a, a sort of a, a winter maintenance stroke, severe winter reserve, which is several million pounds, which is we, we tend to put a million pounds a year into that when the winter isn't bad, and that's for doing a lot more gritting when the winter is bad. So we've got that as a specific separate one. I don't think we've got a specific flooding reserve, though, but the unearmed reserve can be used to cover that. Thank you. I think the cash, cash flow statement was covered by Simon's questions. Um, and the only other thing is on the grant income. I mean, yes, we've had the COVID one, and we've also got these grants. Again, it's just, just asking the question, well, it's great to get the grants. It's just making sure we're monitoring the grants and that all the signposts along the way are getting hit and the information's there. Because clearly, if you get a grant and you don't hit all those, um, likely to be penalties and money's paid back that you've already spent. So... Again, it's just to check that we've still got a robust monitoring system for grants. We do, and it's worth saying that when um, support for businesses first came out, uh, we were really quite careful and went through a whole series of checks when we were paying them out, despite the government saying, no, 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 just pay these, and, and publishing lead tables that showed that other cities were paying them quicker than us. Lo and behold, nine and 12 months later, They've come along and done a load of audits of people who've paid those out and told people off and paid them paid them out too quickly. And we had a very, very low error rate in that, in that government audit because we, we took our time to do it properly at the time. And we knew full well that when the government says, just pay it out, don't worry about controls, they don't actually mean that. They mean that down the line, um, they will expect us to have put a load of controls in place, which, which they did. So we've been the right side of, of, of those controls. As and when we have a risk management report, though, you know, one of the risks we've got in our, on our risk register is the, the risk that we uh, mispaid COVID grants because we've had a lot of money and been told to pay it out very quickly. And in some cases, actually been told to pay it out before we could run it through our, our council governance processes. Jill has a series of processes we should follow when we accept grants to take them to members and things. But it's just been not possible always to, to, 
to jump through all the necessary hoops and that because they've come in. We've literally had money come into the bank account before we've been told it's coming at times, whereas we should accept it all first. So there is a series of, of, of pressures there, and we do have a risk in our risk register around grants and the dangers that we, we inadvertently trip up on that. But we are very well aware of the risk. Okay. That's thank you for the officers. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you, you two, for your hard questions. Have, oh, my goodness me, here we go. Angela. Well, Councillor Pratchek has asked the two questions I wanted to ask on the uh, income and expenditure statement. So I just would like a clarification on note 34 that is on the reserves. I think um, Councillor uh, Crown Jones asked the question, but I think I was on the wrong page and... Um, couldn't see the numbers, so uh, could you clarify, Dave, about the uh, other earmark revenue reserves, because those have gone up. Is that where the COVID grants that were um, um, carried forward are, or did I misunderstand that? No, you understand that correctly. Okay, thank you. Ben, did you... Oh, right. <laughs> very nicely done. Okay, well, thank you all very much for your contributions, and particularly from our external auditors. Um, and I'm frantically looking here. Is there actually um, a recommendation that I should be reading out to everybody at this moment, or are we just saying we're going to note all this and thank you very much? We don't have to sign it now, do we? When are we, when are we the follow-up is it gets signed, doesn't it, Dave? When, okay. when we, when's the set signing ceremony? Uh, the, uh, when our external colleagues tell us they've, they've finished their work uh, entirely, then we will be saying, please, to Sean Ed and Eugene, can you sign the accounts in the letter of rep? So the recommendation for, to this committee is to give delegated authority to, to the chair to sign the accounts in the letter of rep on their, be their behalf, and we should do that. I think the auditors have said um, by, by the end of the month, but I'll, I'll let them correct that if I'm, or very early next month, uh, very early next month, I'm getting some, some, some nodding on for, for that. So the recommendation is that the, the committee notes the report I and found it. delegates authority to yeah. you to sign the accounts. Uh, Angela. Um, I know that the, the auditors are saying that they don't expect any changes um, uh, or anything on full stop, but what happens if there are any problems? Do we reconvene to agree to the accounts? So what we would typically do in a delegated author authority or approval situation is um, update our final audit uh, results report and share that with the chair of the audit committee and with Eugene to say this is this is the conclusion of the audit now. So we've updated the report to show everywhere that we've concluded the work. Um, what we would suggest, even if there's nothing coming out, is that we perhaps have a call with the chair of the audit committee to, so that she can ask any questions on, on your behalf. If anything does arise between now and um, approval of the accounts that is significant, then we would discuss that with Eugene and the chair and then make a determination as to whether or not that needs to come back to the, the whole committee before, because it would probably undermine the delegation. Yeah. I'm content with that, Angela. Thank you. Good question. The recommendations we've noted, we've thanked, and you have to give me approval to sign these at the appropriate time. Is that agreed? Right, stunned silence. Thank you all very much for that. And if you two want to be going because you have buses, trains, aeroplanes to catch, and we'll see you in March, is it? Yes, right. thank you. That'd be great. Thank you very much. And now we move on to item eight, which is another of your sort of packs of papers. We've had three lumps of papers, and this is... Uh, hmm? 
that. Thank you, Eugene. Um, so, item eight is the Information Governance Annual Report. And Sarah is going to speak to us on it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Data compliance remains a key priority for the Council. We're now in the third financial year, 2020-2021 was the third financial year of what is now called the UK GDPR, GDPR at that time, and the Data Protection Act. And the Council's working really hard to ensure compliance through a number of frameworks and the UK GDPR action plan. I'm happy to go through some of the headlines with you. That's absolutely fine. So the first one, subject access requests. So you can see in 2020, 2021, that we handled 326 subject access requests and we answered 170 of those in time. That is a drop to 52% from where we were the previous year, 85%. And this drop really was caused by the um, pandemic. A freedom of information request, a similar uh, 2020, 2021, we received 1,543 requests, of which we answered just over 64% on time. So again, we've, we've had a drop from where we were the previous year, just over 93%. The target rate for the Information Governance Board for Freedom of Information requests rests at 95%. So unfortunately, we were below that, but we are making up for that this year. Can I ask if we've ever hit it? Because you did the, we said that previously it was 93.25. Have we ever hit 95? I'm not aware that we have, Lee, I would you know? Uh, we haven't, Chair. And not in the last five years. Can I ask what the impact of non-compliance is? Yeah, non-compliance has um, quite a, a number of um, issues, I suppose you could call them, for the Council. Uh, one of them being trust, um, another one being um, fines, ICO inspections. Um, I can't think of any more at the top of my head. And due to the fact that we haven't hit the figures this time, and you mentioned fines, is there going to be a significant financial impact? No, I don't believe so. We're working very hard to bring up our compliance rate. I think everybody's very aware of the impact that COVID has had on, um, on governance of freedom of information requests. Um, I'm hoping that um, the work that's been done will evidence that we've taken it very seriously. Um, so far, the ICO have been happy with, with what we've put in place, yes. Julian. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to add to that, um, we, myself and uh, Sarah, I think you were around at the time, weren't you? Mike Weston had a call with the ICO, so, so we actually um, proactively contacted the ICO and had a conversation with them because we were aware of the... It, it was the, following on the, from the impact of the, um, of the pandemic and the, the lockdown, particularly when we'd um, diverted staff from, um, from supporting information management onto frontline. So we'd um, had a conversation with the ICO and they were supportive um, whilst we, they, to give us some time to try and, and correct that. And Sarah's done a fantastic job. Sarah's only been in post since uh, August. And, and she's done a fantastic job to, to get our FOI levels, uh, response levels back up. Um, we, uh, so the, the ICO are quite, um, are okay for now on freedom of information. Um, what, what we're less comfortable with is the um, subject access request, and I'm sure Sarah will, will uh, perhaps um, mention that 
going forward, but, but that's an area that we still need to focus on. Can you say Yeah. Um, our compliance rate for the last three months is over 90%, so it's 90.88%. So you can see that we are steadily increasing our compliance rate. Um, we've put systems in place to address freedom of information requests, um, better monitoring of those, better IT systems to support us with those. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that we, you know, we've come out the other side of, of the impact of COVID and we're, we're on the right side now and, and looking up. SARS, as Gillian said, is a little bit more work involved in, in bringing that um, response rate up to, up to a suitable um, level. Um, work is taking place on subject access request responses and resource has um, been put in place really to focus on those. Um, teams understand the importance of those um, request times and are working incredibly hard to, to address them. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was information security and um, just to really let you know that um, we are working very hard on something called sensitivity labels. And I'm sure any of you that, that's using email at the moment knows, uh, knows all about sensitivity labels. Um, really, this is just to, to support us with, with um, the framework, um, to manage our information better and to ensure its security. And that's an ongoing program of, of IT changes that, that we're putting in place to support us with that. I was just going to talk a little bit, a bit about information um, security breaches. Um, so that's on page 227. You can see that in 2020, 2021, 262 um, security incidents were, were um, logged with our um, information security incident process, which is now an automated process. Uh, most of those breaches involved personal data and they were caused by human error. Um, we're working incredibly hard to train staff on the importance of um, responsibility, on, re on the importance of protecting data. And I can move on to talk about our, our training that we, we have in place. Um, we've got quite a number of information governance training modules available for staff. However, I think the most important one is our information governance training, which is compulsory for staff to take. They do that yearly. So when they first arrive as a new member of staff, they take that and then that's logged and they do that yearly. It, uh, uh, as of last month, 88.98% of council staff had completed the module. And I know having looked at recent figures, that's just, that's gone up a little bit as well uh, recently. And 96% of social care staff had completed the um, training in time for us to submit the toolkit. We've recently um, updated the training as well. And um, I'm hoping that we will see even more compliance with that. We're going to have a better system in place to monitor that, uh, to update it as well. Thank you. And if anybody's got any questions. Oh, um, I'm going to start with Angela. And then... Just a very quick one, uh, Sarah, if you don't mind. Uh, is some of the, um, I was just looking at the figures in Appendix A uh, in terms of the uh, subject access requests and the performance not having improved as much as the FOI request. Uh, is it partly to do with staff being um, put on other duty during the year and so being less well resourced? Is that one of the reasons why we can't catch up? 
Yeah, I, it was a little bit before my time, as, as um, Julian mentioned, I started in August, but my understanding is that um, staff were redeployed um, during the pandemic to support um, other areas of the council's work. And so, of course, that's going to have a knock-on effect um, to responding in time. They're all back to normal duties now and picking up that work and, and working through it. David. Just a couple of quick things. Firstly, home working, I wonder how that's impacted on your information security. Uh, I suspect it's had a fair impact. And the other one's just around FOIs, and uh, <clears throat> where you're almost entirely re reliant on other people to achieve your targets. And I just wonder if those other people give this the priority you'd expect them to. And if not, are we doing anything about that? Yeah, I would say that home working has, has had its challenges because it was just so immediate. You know, people were working in the office one day and suddenly home and working the next day. Um, I think the IT team did a sterling job in setting everybody up. The networks were secure, um, so I wouldn't have any concerns about that. I think that there were... Uh, uh, an increase in training and awareness to remind staff of the importance when they're working from home. So, you know, make sure that you lock your, your laptop down, make sure, you know, you haven't got other family members in the room if you're in a meeting or if you've got your work notes out. So it was, it was, it was about being, um, you know, engaged with your working environment and understanding that you were working somewhere differently and you had to be a little bit more aware. Um, so I would say that I would say it's, it's been a success to the point that I think we will continue this kind of hybrid working where we work a little bit from home and we work a little bit in the office. It, it's, it is working for the council and I've got no concerns about um, the security of, of people working from home. And your second question. That was just around uh, freedom of information and whether the people you rely on to provide you with that information give it the priority you think they should and if not, whether we should be doing something about that. That's a really good question. I think people are becoming more aware and more alert to the fact that when, um, when a data subject requests information that we have a duty to respond to them in a timely manner and to recognise what a request is, that if they get an email saying something, you know, they recognise that that is a request for information and they understand then what they need to, to do with that so it's actioned and it's actioned within the, within the time frame. I would say that as we progress each year that that is becoming more second nature to, to members of staff, that they understand what they're looking at. Um, I'm confident that with, with training as well, we're doing our, well, our yearly training, our refresher courses, and as members know, uh, we, we're rolling out at the moment FOI training for members, which I'm, I'm hoping you'll all join us for, that that will support us as well in, in improving our compliance rates. Thank you. just wanted to ask um, under I think it was where are we on page 234 when we've got I think the, um, the breaches which were investigated by the ICO and several of them say closed the case and made several recommendations are those recommendations we then uh, peculiar, if you like, to each complaint, or are they ones which will then go into general practice? Apologies. Yeah, some of them are very generic, generic. so it could be something like, please ensure your, your staff refresh on their data protection training. And that's really important that that is carried through. And I, you know, ensure that's carried through because whilst it sounds a bit generic, it is important that people do that training. Other ones could be relevant to, um, to that specific incident that's happened. Um, I'm happy, I've, I've pulled up a few, so I'm, I'm happy there's quite a number of them, um, recommendations. 
it could be things like reviewing your policies, your procedures, um, making sure your electronic devices um, are secure, you know, don't, you know, put your proper password in or make a, a stronger password, things like that. Um, you know, don't, don't leave your, your paper with personal data lying around, keep it secure. So a lot of them tend to be those generic ones. I can certainly spend a few minutes with you and look through each case and, and give you an idea of, of you know, more specific recommendations. But I think what, I've, what I'd like you to understand is that at the council, those recommendations aren't just brushed aside. Oh, lovely, we've, we've, you know, we're sorted, let's move on to the next thing. They're reviewed, they're checked, they're audited. You know, are you actually doing this? I'm meeting with people when they get um, you know, an ICO recommendation. Have you implemented this? Great, how's it going? What's the progress? You know, what, what do you think you'll do next to make sure this isn't happening again? So I think, you know, that's important that they are understood and recognized as important. Thank you, that was really comprehensive. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Ben. Sorry, it's quite minor, so I was wondering whether I should actually ask it or not. But I guess what I don't fully get is, so, so we monitor things like the number of breaches with information security. They don't quite always get the impact of that. So one breach that affects 500 people counts as one. So for example, there was the issue with allotments where allotment holders got um, a debt a debt collection demand by error instead of their annual bill or whatever it was, something to that effect. That would count as one incident, wouldn't it? Whereas in effect that went to hundreds of people. So the impact was bigger than one incident might, might suggest. So it's, it's more just a point for future. If we could maybe have a, a metric that might show the nature of the impact of, of at least the key incidents, whether, it be the, whether that be financial or whether it be large numbers of people. Because if you've got 262 and they affect one person each, that's quite different to a number that would have a, a much larger effect. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. I'm, I'm happy to, to look through um, anything in the report and revise for next year. Um, what I would say on our quest um, to, to integrate, integrate more IT and more... Um, modern ways of working. We've got a great new system that we're using now to report our security incidents. And so I can really drill down on that and understand. And that, I think that goes back to the question about recommendations. I'm able to properly understand what's going on, what portfolio is this affecting? Is this happening often? You know, what are the trends that are going on here? So I'm absolutely happy to bring that back to, um, to for next year. That's not a problem. Right, we'll all have to make sure we're back on this committee next year now, so that you'll know what you've done. Um, can I just say thank you very much, both to you and to Leon, for coming. Um, I think that's, that's been incredibly useful. I certainly hold my head in shame and say I wasn't aware that we were supposed to be doing FOI training as members, and it's something I shall look up tomorrow so that I can make sure that I do it. And I certainly am sure that all of our committee members will want to lead by example on this. So thank you very much. So agenda item number nine, and this is you, Gillian, I think, on whistleblowing. Thank you. Claire's come along to present that. Claire, Claire Cornyn, head of HR. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Um, so the report that you've got in front of you today is providing an update on where we are with whistleblowing and our policy. Um, we've reviewed the policy itself and we deem it to continue to be fit for purpose, although there have been a few minor amendments um, listing the details of the names of people to contact if you want to report a whistleblowing um, incident. We've provided some statistics around the use of this policy, um, which We've taken a data set from April 2018, which is when the committee had the last report. Um, so it has been a while since I believe it's been discussed here. Um, in that period of three years, however, just short of three years, that, that just about for four years, sorry, um, there has only been five reports of um, uh, the whistleblowing 
um, which is relatively low for an organisation of our size and our complexity, which is why the primary focus of the report is to look at how we can um, address that and really promote the use of whistleblowing. We do know that we have other instances of cases that people use other mechanisms to report, such as dignity and respect, um, and allegations of, um, of, of inappropriate behaviour that they don't use the whistleblowing policy um, to report through. Um, so we want to put a targeted approach together whereby we promote our whistleblowing policy, promote the ways in which people can report it. We're increasing our capacity to be able to report it through the increased use of contact officers. So when we introduce contact officers, historically we appointed seven um, people alongside seven whistleblowing champions, so 14 people in total. Um, we only have now five contact officers, um, and when we've spoken to them recently, um, they are very conscious that they are not actively promoting their role as contact officers, and they would, they've asked for some support to do that. To increase um, the visibility of this policy and hope, therefore, I know it sounds perverse that we're wanting people to whistleblow, but it's the right thing that people do, um, to increase the opportunity for people to, to use this policy. Um, our targeted approach is going to be through the use of um, posters, emails, um, everything that you can think of. We're going to throw the kitchen sink at this. We're going to be sending um, communications out um, to managers, encouraging people to use PDR conversations, to, to encourage people to volunteer. It's a voluntary role on top of somebody's day job, so there would be a release of time for them to be involved and there would be a re release of time for them to be trained very important that we train contact officers appropriately and that they've got the support mechanism through HR so that they're able to deal with the queries that come in. There has been hesitancy um, across um, the, the contact officers to continue because they feel that training has been inadequate. We need to be upfront about that and, and address their concerns. Um, so the recruitment campaign um, were due to start to coincide with the return to the workplace. Um, bearing in mind that we have a significant proportion of the workforce not using um, office space at the moment, using being in depots, etc. Um, we want to maximise that opportunity to really promote this and make sure we've got everything aligned to that, that, that we then get the right number of people um, applying. We will not be limiting the number of contact officers. Clearly, if we get 1,000, we'll have to think again, but we're expecting to get no more than 20, 30 people um, volunteering to, to take on this role, and we feel that that would be an appropriate um, number to, to train. But we're not going to limit it. We're not going to set a target on it. Um, we're just going to see what happens as part of the recruitment campaign. If we don't get sufficient, we'll continue to market this um, and continue to encourage people to, to, to join the, the programme. Um, the contact officers, as I said, we had seven originally, five. Um, we're not expecting any of them to continue, um, is what we're being told. So we do need to think about increasing um, that number um, with not relying on those, those five people. So the purpose of the paper today is to ask you to note those plans, um, note the five cases. There's an appendices in there that gives you more details. It is anonymised, um, and clearly I can't answer any questions that go into the detail around the individual cases. Um, but the, it will give you a feel for the nature of the, the, the cases that we've had historically over those near four years. Thank you, Claire. Angela? Thank you, Claire, for that. Um, if an employee doesn't, for whatever reason, doesn't want to use a contact advisor, say because there is not none that are near to them, um, what's the procedure? To, to whistleblow. That would be interesting for us to see. And my second question is on the appendix. Um, so appendix one. So there is one case at the very bottom. And I, I, I'm really not interested in the case uh, per se, but just in terms of time frame, when there is an incident, how long does it take and are the targets, you know, we need to sort, sort this out by, um, and obviously this one is still ongoing. Why is it still ongoing? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the whistleblowing policy enables you to report whistleblowing to a range of different people. Prim pr the primary contact could be your line manager, your manager's manager, or anybody within the management chain, contact officers, or, uh, 
there's also whistleblowing champions, of which we've got seven. We've just updated that list as part of a part of a review, um, and those people are still on that list. We will have to update it again because we have a couple of people on that list that will be leaving the organisation through the voluntary um, severance and voluntary redundancy scheme. But there's a whole range of different um, communities that you could um, contact. We're also talking to our newly created networks. So we are along the lines of the equality, diversity and inclusion agenda. Um, we've been really promoting the use of representative groups and we've got a um, race equality network, used to be called our race safe space. We have a disability confident forum. Um, and again, we're talking to those groups around whether they would also be prepared um, to, to acknowledge receipt of, of, of whistleblowing claims. I'm very confident that they would. We just need to ensure that they know what to do with them um, when they receive them and the difference between um, a, a, an allegation of something happening and a claim of whistleblowing, which are two very different things. Um, the time frames is a really interesting one. Um, and unfortunately, no two cases are the same. It all depends on the complexity of the investigation. It, it, it's whether the police are involved, for example, the nature of the allegation um, can mean that there are different things that we need to do. I have looked at this particular case because I do have concerns about it being open um, from the 1st of, uh, of August and we're now nearly into, into February. Um, there are a number of factors. Um, there is no agreed timeline. Um, I am confident that this allegation will be resolved by the end of this month. And I have asked that I am alerted if it is not, with a real reason as to why not. The, the reasons I can give you, Angela, is that we had an investigator that we had to change because of some conflict of interest. And we had um, a pandemic in the sense of people not being available due to ill health and being affected by that. We also had, uh, we also have trade unions um, who um, are very supportive of this process um, but are very keen to hold meetings that are um, face to face and obviously when you're dealing with a pandemic and um, the opportunity to do that it has been quite limited um, and that has impacted on this particular case um, that you're referring to at the bottom there. Thank you Chair. Um, I am mindful that this is five cases over 31 months, so it's over quite a period of time. I, I'm just wondering, because they are all from the people portfolio, and if, if is it a sign of a more underlying problem, or is it just that people in the people portfolio are more comfortable in whistleblowing? Because even though you've got a whistleblowing policy, it's how comfortable are people to whistle blow. And I just wonder, it's difficult because you're down to five people who are inactive and you've got a pandemic and people are working at a distance. So um, that would make things different. I just think going forward as a suggestion that if we continue to be in one portfolio is to look to see if there's an underlying problem. And also why aren't, I'm not saying that the, there's automatically a problem in other areas, but is there anything that should be coming forward that's not coming forward in the other portfolios? Thank you. I think that's a really helpful observation, Josie. Thank you. Um, I don't really understand why they're all from the people portfolio and I, and I haven't looked into why they are in there. I have looked at where the current contact officers are that no longer want to, to participate. They're all in the, people, in the place portfolio. Um, so the, there's no correlation between the two which I've been able to identify. Um, our ambition is to really um, look at making sure that moving forward we have um, representation that we can promote um, across all portfolios so we're not having all of our contact officers in one. That will hopefully then prompt um, people to feel comfortable um, going to people that they may know and be less anxious about raising their concerns. I think also it, it goes back to the point that I made um, uh, uh, as part of what I was talking about. Um, there are other mechanisms for people to raise their concerns. And I think if we look at the other portfolios, um, there is a real cross section across all portfolios where people are raising dignity of respect um, and other forms of allegations where they could have used whistleblowing if they'd have taken it one step further. Um, and it's that balance that we need to factor into the communications of, of what do we mean by whistleblowing and, and where do we draw that line. Thank you for that. And, and I do know what you're saying. And some people might feel comfortable talking to somebody 
that you know, but depending on what it is they want to whistleblow, they could equally feel more comfortable talking to somebody not known to them or not within their workspace. So it's just making sure that they know that they don't have to go, a people person doesn't have to go through a people portfolio. And similarly, a place person, excuse my voice, <laughs> doesn't have to go to one in their own portfolio, they could go to somewhere else. Thank you. I had some questions too. Um, I wanted to know the relationship of whistleblowing with our trade unions. I'm assuming that they are supportive of the policy and how you work between you if, <coughs> if somebody whistleblows through the union to make sure that everything has a similar trajectory. Um, where do the support people come from? Is it, what, do you have to be at a particular level in the organisation to be one? And do we also have people in the blue collar parts of our organization who also take part? And finally, what support do we give to whistleblowers? Because get, finding somebody to whistleblow to is fine. And then all the out, all that happens afterwards is all a bit hard. So what support do we give there? Okay, thank you. Um, Trade unions um, are very supportive of this, of this policy. Um, indeed, all of our policies are actually created in partnership with the trade unions. So um, when we undertook the review of this policy, it was in partnership with them. Um, and we talked, we talked at our local um, negotiation committee um, around those policies. Um, they are there to also, I'm jumping onto your, your third question, if I may, because they're also one of the main points of contact for the whistleblower. Um, and they are one of the mechanisms that support those individuals along with the individual's line manager if they're not involved in the actual allegation, et cetera, um, or other nominated people can be identified. Um, we try and keep it outside of the, any HR process because obviously we're there to support management in the context of that and it, it avoids conflict. So we would look to the support for the individual to come from within either the business or their trade union or any other representative that they feel is appropriate. Um, so, sorry, I've answered one and three there. Um, in the sense of who, um, anybody, um, technically I would want them to have the right attributes um, and the right um, ability to be able to deal with some of those allegations. Sometimes there can be um, lots of emotion around those, so it's about having that strong personality where or we can develop that personality trait where they can then um, be able to, to, to manage um, that. It's quite a... Um, it's quite a unique position to be in where somebody is sharing with you their lived experience, their personal experience, the impact that that has had on them, and that can therefore impact on the person that's receiving that information. But when it comes to the grade of them, which part of the organisation they're in, that is totally irrelevant um, to some extent. And to be fair, um, you know, we've got some, uh, some people that you would class in, in, in the lower grades that are probably better than some of the colleagues in the senior grade because they'll jump to wanting to solve the problem and head it off at the past rather than really listening to the individual. And it's those types of skills that we're looking for, not um, the seniority of, of the position. Um, I did look at the, the five contact officers that are currently in place but will not be. Four of them are in the place portfolio. Mix of grades, but predominantly between and grade six and grade eight. So again, our targeted communication needs to be very clear. It's for everybody, anybody. These are the attributes that we're looking for. These are the things that you might experience. Do you fancy it? Talk to your line manager about whether they feel it would be a good move for you. In that case, can we agree the recommendations? I think we shouldn't just note it, we should encourage it and say we, you know, if we can help support anything with your publicising or your plans for getting contact advisors, please ask. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Well, could I just suggest that uh, Claire, Sarah and uh, Leon are allowed to, to leave now? <laughs> If they wish to, they may wish to stay. I, I think they probably want to stay because audit is such a riveting committee. But if they do wish to go, they can. I'd, I'd stay because it's Linda Hunter next. Um, we're now going on to item 10, which is um, 
progress on no assurance, limited assurance, high organisational impact, opinion audit reports. Linda. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is the report that I bring to this committee every six months. And like the Chair just said, it, it's, it's giving you um, an outline of the recommendations that are outstanding for our, our no assurance reports and limited assurance reports with high impact. Um, the key points on it and um, some positive feedback, there are five reports listed in this, in this, this, this document um, to actually remove because all the recommendations have now been implemented. Um, we've added one new report and that's relating to the adult safeguarding. That um, has been issued as a limited and high impact and the details of that one will be in the next report that I bring to you back in June because the recommendation and the implementation dates haven't, haven't hit the deadline yet. Um, in this report, it's got 34 recommendations that we're tracking. 23 have been implemented, so that's 68%, and 11 are ongoing. So that's some quite positive news there. We've still got one critical recommendation outstanding, and that relates to the OMS, which is the housing management system. Um, that was, the recommendation was around upgrading the system. We've upgraded the system now, but the feedback I've got back is that it's got limited functionality, so the improvements haven't been made. So what they need to do now is to test and rebuild the new system. So that is why the timeline on that is, is quite lengthy. I did take this report to the Performance and Delivery Board back in November. And what they requested for that critical recommendation was they wanted to do what they called a deep dive exercise. So what they wanted to look at, you know, what, what, what is the problem here? Is it staff resource? Is it investment? Is it change management? You know, they, they wanted to do a good, a good review of this, this, this outstanding recommendation. And also lessons learned, because obviously it is taking time for them to, to implement this. Um, the other feedback I got from the, the board was, and within the people portfolio now, they've got a recommendation tracker that's on SharePoint. So we've got that in place now, that's up and running. So that's similar to the place portfolio. So that should help them be able to track their recommendations. And then they also acknowledge that, obviously, there is a risk here. If the recommendations aren't implemented, then that, that is a risk to the organisation. So they highlighted that. So on the last page, what I'm asking the, the committee to do is to note the content of the report, but also agree the removal of those five, those five reports listed there. There's the enforcement agent review, appointee ship service review, the council processes for managing investigations, controls in the town hall, and the data security and protection toolkit. So those are all the five that we can remove now because all the recommendations have been implemented. So has anybody got any questions on that report? Thank you, Linda. Um, on, uh, on, the on the table itself, on page 257, oh, sorry, 53, um, the imp implementation time for um, incident management report, etc., um, has that been done by? It's obviously there was a, a time scale for that. Is, has that been completed now by the 31st of um, December? Because obviously this went in November. So yeah, and the meeting delayed, yeah. Yeah, so is that completed now? Yeah, I can actually, the drive has actually stayed on for this, for this year. So um, there has been progress, and so I can give you an update on this one, if that's all right. Excellent. Um, and there are quite a few of those dates that are for December, obviously, on that report. And also, um, on page 255, it, it says a revised implementation ongoing three-year transformation plan. When is the start date of those three years so that we can work out what the end date is? Uh, do you want me to answer the first? The one that you just raised on the page 253, the start date of that, three-year plan was from the November 21 when, when the officers gave me that update. So the three years are from November 21. So that's for that one. And then Sarah can answer the one on the information security. Thank you. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so as you can see, the original implementation date for this was December 2019. Um, and that's, that's rolled forward um, quite a bit. I think the main reason for that has been because of COVID. We've been concentrating on other things. One of my biggest tasks when I joined in August was, was to, to get us back on track with things. And one of those was um, reporting information security incidents. What I would say is that 
since this was started in, in I'm assuming at some point in 2019, we've progressed with technology. And so now what we've implemented is ServiceNow, which is a ticketing system. So we implemented that before my revised implementation uh, time frame, which was the end of December. So that's already in place now. So if you were to raise a security incident, you would raise it through IT, through the ticketing system, and that would come through to us. So we're on it with that, and, and I'm pleased that that's working. We've had a, a few weeks now to embed that, and, and that's, that's doing well. The second part now of, of that ticket is for us to work with IT on phase two, which is to start drilling down and understanding the analysis. So at the moment, I can have some basic um, uh, reports and analysis. I think I mentioned to Ben earlier a little bit about those. So that's really good. That's that's um, that's a progress forward. What we'd like to do with that then is is to forward that on at IGWG to information asset owners to review what the mitigation um, procedures we've put in place and our recommendations, and then that gets a sign off. So really, in effect, you're, you're doing a full circle with that. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about not just having recommendations in place, but to have some scrutiny of those recommendations that they've actually been, you know, fulfilled and actioned. Our IGWG working, the working group, Information Governance Working Group, is um, coming up. So the first one for, for this quarter um, is, is coming up at the end of January. And that's where we're going to take this report um, and just make sure that everybody's on board with the new way that we're going to be doing things. Because as I said, the, the system that was put in place in 2019, it was very paper orientated. We've, we've moved with the times, we've moved with technology, and we'd like to do this in, the, in this ticketing service, uh, ticketing system in a much more secure way. And that then, that then means that on my dashboard, I can see the progress of that and make sure that things are being implemented. Does, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Right. Uh, page 257, there is another date, end of January. So are we on track with that? Because obviously today's the 20th. Um, it's um, uh, 4.1 in the direct payment section. Um, yeah, I've asked for an update, but I haven't had the update in time for this meeting. So what I'll have to do, I can... I'll chase the update and then I can email around all the members, yeah. So that's 4.1 on the direct payment. I've got some questions and I, I think I've said to you, Linda, that when I actually looked at the proposals around the... Um, the housing repairs and etc. system, my response was, ah, because this was something which I believe has been ongoing since 2018, and we're now looking at perhaps September 2023 to actually sort this out. And that's, well, I think it's appalling. And I don't know whether, just as a laywoman, that is appalling, or whether that is how long these things take. I rather suspect it isn't. And I think the fact that people can keep saying, well, we'll put it back and we'll look at whether we should just do nothing or whether we ought to start to rebuild, etc. I mean, sorry, I, I look as if I'm shooting the messenger and I'm certainly not intending to. But when we know that sort of our housing re repairs and response and everything has been so rotten, how come... This is, you know, you said there's going to be a deep dive into it now. How long does a deep dive take? And when will we get the result of that particular dive? Yeah, I think that was the frustration when I took it to the performance and delivery board. It highlighted to them that it's been outstanding for a while now. So it's on the agenda for, well, it was on this, this January's agenda, but we've had to push it back now because of other things with the 
COVID and Plan B. But they've got it on the agenda now for the 8th of March, and that's where the project lead is going to take it and explain, you know, what's happening with the project and the delays in the timeline. So, so that is where they'll get challenged and asked questions at that meeting. So it's the 8th of March is the, the actual meeting, but I don't know how long it'll take, you know, how much they'll push it to get an implementation. So it, yeah, it could take. Wearing an unofficial hat, <laughs> I have been shadowing people in housing recently. I'm a little bit surprised at this because they started the implementation of the computer system in November. It's now been working for five weeks. So maybe the 2023 is by the time, because obviously the, the IT system you put in, even with the best planning in the world, isn't exactly the IT system you are still operating two or three years later. So I'm a little bit surprised that because it was having spoken, it was that many meetings, it was track of exactly which day, but I have spoken to the repair service since Christmas and it's been in operation for five weeks. Some of the things are working really well. Some things have got teething problems, but bearing in mind they've got people operating an IT system where they've always had paper systems before, so you've got people out in the field that have now got tablets and connectivity. Um, and it's about it's some of the things, it's going to be around training. They've had training, but it's real life training that they need to do so they, they, they mark things off properly rather than just return, 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 which affects the collation of data. So I think when you get to your meeting, you'll find that it's already implemented. So I don't, I don't know what they've got as a 2023 date for that. So maybe that's the whole of the rebuild and the connectivity with customer service, which eventually all the different sides will speak to each other and the, they'll be self-served by housing tenants and various other people so maybe it's the bringing together of all that but various elements have already been been implemented including the customer service side and the repair side but because it's so complex they've not pushed them together straight away so i hope that's helpful and i hope that's it sounds like some progress has been made and like i say it's probably the full implementation is that date they've given rather than but like I say, there's probably going to be different there's going to be different phases, different strands that they release at different times. So, yeah, and probably a lot of testing on it. Yeah, okay, but the, the deep dive report comes on the 8th of March, did you say? No, but that's when the, that is when, yeah, the, the, the project lead is going to take it to the performance and delivery board. So that's when they're going to be discussing it. So, so yeah, I should be able to, so the next time I bring this report will be June. So I can, I'll have that information feedback from that from that meeting then. Okay, and the, yeah. when, when's our next report from it's June? June? June 22, so, yeah. It's definitely a case of we'll all have to get back on this committee, won't we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that, that was all I wanted to ask. I'm, if, if there's any updates in between that you can bring us joy with an email, that would be very good. Um, so, apart from that, can we, again, looking for quickly for all the recommendations. Um, making sure I've got it here. Yeah. Yeah. The content the report and then to agree to remove the five. Yes, reports yes we can because implemented. they are finally implemented. Um, so thank you for sort of good and bad news. But again, if there's anything we can do to act as your um, what's it, enforcer, do see Simon's excited already then we you know if there's anything we can do to add weight to what you're trying to do then please do ask because you know this is really important that when internal audit reports and makes recommendations that those are taken seriously by other departments because it's about what we're doing for the people of Sheffield out there it's not about making you happy it's about making things work for the people that we serve. So thank you very much, Linda. Rapidly trying to find my next item, which is item 11, and it's the um, report for...
from Birmingham City Council who came to look at our internal audit uh, function. So carry yep. on. Yeah, thank you, Chet. This is the report um, from the, the, the peer review, the independent review that the Birmingham City Council did on the audit service. Um, the main point to note is from the recommendations is that they've actually rated us saying that we, we conform. Now, the word conform doesn't always give away a lot of details, but that was the highest possible accreditation we could get. So, so that was good news, but yeah, just to explain what the conform means. Um, they, they, they got to that conclusion by interviewing a number, of, a number of key officers. They reviewed responses from surveys and questionnaires, and then they also looked at my self-assessment. So um, overall, there was 115, just through some statistics, there was 115 questions. We conformed in 89 of those, those areas. We partially complied with 14, and then there was 12 that weren't applicable to, to our internal audit. Um, and so the good news was that they, they actually, the, the report they actually produced, they made eight recommendations and we agreed to all of them. I've put implementation dates down for them all. And the last implementation date will be the September 22 because a couple of the recommendations relate to my annual report that I bring to this committee. So even though it seems a long timeline, it's, it's when I bring the next report. But yeah, the overall feedback was that it was a well-established and embedded service. Um, and that we were trusted and valued and we were independent and objective. So, yes, yeah, some quite good praise in, in the report. So if anybody's got any questions? Angela. Just an observation, I was just looking at, because um, when I started reading it, I wrote next to, to it, I said, how are we going to ensure um, how we internal audit implement recommendations? And then... The answer is just give lots of work to Linda because everything I think is you, isn't it? That's got to implement things. So, um, and I'm assuming that the ones that were so it's supposed to be implemented by the end of December and are now in place, and it's just the ones that. Sorry, there was three to be implemented by the end of December. Two have been implemented already, and then there was one about the um, declaration of endorsement, um, which was about it was basically about where I sit in the, the organisation. Eugene has signed that off. I'm just waiting for the chief exec to sign that off. So that one's nearly been completed, but say it's, it's been produced. It's just waiting for a sign off on that one. And then, yeah, as far as the review goes, I obviously I have my updates with the head of strategic finance. I have regular one-to-ones with him. But what I will do is also once I've implemented all this, that'll be September. I can then, when I bring the annual report, I can give feedback then as well that I should have actioned all of these 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 recommendations as well to that that committee. So you will get to know if I've actioned them all. I, just on page 285, um, consideration be given to the development of a governance and ethics audit universe. Yeah, what's, what's that? Yeah, what they mean by, we have this, what they mean by an audit universe is it could be it could be a service, it could be an area, it could be a system. It's, it's what we call our universe. It's everything that we could possibly audit. So we have thousands and thousands of areas and, and systems, processes we could audit. So what they just suggest was if we refresh, because obviously ethics is quite a key area in, in governance. So they just, when they looked at our big universe, they did suggest if we just refresh that and have a look at, you know, what could we put on our audit plan, particularly for next year and what's key. So... And we can link that in if we looked at our um, risk register, our corporate risk register as well. So we've got documents we can use to, to link that in. But also I've put on there that I would have, we have core cities, what we call core cities, head of audit groups. So again, I can use, I can use that, that forum to see what other authorities use as the, their audit universe, as we, as we call it. Yeah. Just to say to you, you have just touched on something where I have ripped the audit team for a number of years about what the parameters of the audit universe are. So you've just touched on that. But, but seriously, Linda made a point earlier. Um, you know, <laughs> audit is not known for prone to excitement. And conform is actually a splendid endorsement of what is a small but effective audit team. So, and thank you, Angela, for the points you're making there about, about the, the level of follow that Linda and the team do. Just on that very uh, one about the ethics, have you, uh, is there enough time to actually put it in place by March? I just was uh, surprised that it would take just a few months to implement. 
um, you know, changing completely. Or yeah, no, that time frame will be fine because we have, we have to be fair, we have started to look at this. We've identified some areas that we, we can include already. So, so yeah, the, the March was fine. And I put it in there because obviously I, we, I'll be bringing the audit plan for next year in April. So I needed it done really before, before I bring the plan to you. So yeah, that time frame, it does seem tight, but it, yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, congratulations on conforming. And uh, I think in answer to what Eugene asked, what are the parameters of the universe? I think it's infinity and beyond, isn't it? So, yeah, we're really pleased about this report. So thank you. Um, and our final report is our work program report, which we will now be having our February meeting due to not having had our December meeting. Is there anything that we need to add or take away from this? Sorry, I can't. The housing ombudsman. The housing ombudsman. Right. They said. So, housing ombudsman for February. If, it, if, if, well, it has arrived. We just haven't. Yeah. Because we're all yes, part yes. of one organisation, aren't we? Yes, Chair. Let's let's get it on the agenda, and then I can um, all, always inform you if there's some reason why we can't bring it forward on that day. Thank you. I'll find your report. Go to go set the window. I'm tracking it now. Absolutely. Was there supposed to be something also about the continuing SCN plan, which we've had? Um, we've had people from education. Have I missed it? I'm sure. So, had, had we finished asking about that? Um, I, I think they came <laughs> to a committee towards the end of last year um, and reported. Do, is that members' recollection? I, couldn't, I can't quite remember. Or whether, okay. we, whether they would do a return don't, visit? I don't think so, but okay. it's, it's up to you as a committee if you want them. Okay. Do you, maybe you see what the um, audit re AGS report is this year and then take it from there, perhaps. With the addition of that, can we note this report and approve? That's our work programme. So our next meeting will be on the 24th of February. And we'll have another exciting meeting. Thank you all very much for coming and staying till the end. <laughs>